Hey, good day, everybody. Welcome to Indian Boxer Ring, uh, session two with Rosina Brace. Uh, just want to give you a bit of a story about how uh, this session came about. Um, after the interview, uh, which went rather quickly for me, uh, you know, when I, in terms of, you know, hearing all the wonderful stories, uh, you know, her knowledge, her journey so far, um, I realized that I still had a lot more questions to ask uh, on a lot of topics that I felt would be really important, not only to me, but also to all the viewers that are watching this, uh, this web chat. Um, so one of the other things that I wanted to talk about uh, was what I had listed in the interview, uh, you know, the poster that we actually published on Thursday and also on Friday. Uh, thank you to the IBR team for putting together such a wonderful poster. And, uh, you know, in, in my IBR team, I just want to take a quick moment to uh, to recognize and also thank the other team members uh, who have been instrumental in actually making this work and happen. Uh, I The IBR core team comprises of uh, Kadir, Kadir, Kadir Narayan, uh, Satish, uh, Jaisima, and Sushant. Now, we have an interesting pair ahead of you today. We have uh, important, important topics that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about health. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the breeding aspect of it a little bit more. We're going to talk about artificial insemination. Uh, and also, we're going to talk about uh, the selection of a puppy uh, and how to raise the puppy. And uh, also about handling and grooming and Christina is also going to share some knowledge about judging as well. So we have a lot of interesting questions uh, ahead of you. Uh, now, of course, you will have questions uh, as well. So feel free to you know, place your comments uh, with questions so that we can actually ask that from Rosina. Uh, thank you, Rosina. Thanks for that. We are patiently waiting for my introduction to complete. Uh, I thank you again for your time. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Rosina. Uh, so, uh, you know, we talked about a lot of different things and uh, I actually wanted to talk uh, more specifically about a few topics. Um, so starting with health testing for boxers. I just want to little, give a little bit of premise uh, on about health testing uh, because health testing is uh, a part of ethical breeding and um, you know, the quality or the longevity of the puppies are extremely important and um, on that with that premise i wanted to actually start the interview with my first question to you Regina. how important do you think health testing is to a breeding program well i think it's very important it's uh, the foundation really of the breed and as breeders we are the custodians of that breed and we must do everything we can to ensure longevity and health right true uh now could you talk us about uh, you know I, I know you've seen the evolution of boxes you've seen the time when we've moved from a point of no health testing to health testing now how did that come about well i think <clears throat> myself um, that people become more aware of things and there are more health issues in our breed the boxer in my opinion that there has ever been and some of them have just recently um, popped up you might say in the last year or so and it's quite devastating to think that these things can happen and um, we're in Australia fairly isolated so it has to come in from importing of dogs in my opinion but um, once you are aware of a problem then the thing is that you test and then you can go about eradicating it and uh, it can be quite heartbreaking but in the long run it's the best thing to do people tend not to want to talk about problems they want to be um secretive i suppose you might say but they know it's there but they don't like to acknowledge it and if we don't acknowledge things we will never get on top of it and that's what we have to do um, i would just say a plead to people um in your country in india <clears throat> that they are aware of things and that they 
can do testing. I, I don't know what the situation is there for testing, but um, I'm sure it will come along with everything else that comes. Right. True. Uh, now, um, sorry, give me one second. I, I... Oh, I cannot hear you. I cannot hear you. Is it better? Could you hear me all right? Well, I can hear you now, yes. I couldn't before. Okay, all right. Now, you've dropped, you've dropped off again. It keeps coming and going. Oops. Is it better for you now? Can you hear me? Better now, yes. Wonderful. Okay, all right. Um, th thank you, Rosina. Thanks for sharing that perspective. Um, now, what I wanted to actually ask you was get more into uh, more into health testing, at least you know from the aspect of uh, from the aspect of a litter. Uh, now, we've heard about it. Um, boxer puppies, box, breeding boxes, as you said, is not easy. It's a complex process compared to other breeds, where it's far more easier to breed a litter. Now, when it comes to boxes, we also know of uh, this issue called as hypothyroidism. Would you actually attribute hypothyroidism to diet? You know, when I say hypothyroidism, you're talking about puppies that actually um, get absorbed by the uterus. Um, do you see, what do you attribute that to? Well, I can't say. I mean, I'm, I'm not a veterinarian. And um, some bitches um, can absorb their babies. They can, if you have a scan done at around about four weeks, um, some breeders do it a little earlier, but it's very hard to determine whether there are babies there or not. It depends on the equipment that the veterinarian has, and there can be puppies there. But by the time the bitch is nine weeks uh, into gestation, uh, there are no puppies, and they have reabsorbed them. And there seems to be no real reason as to why. What we do is we do swabs vaginal swabs for any females that are to be bred and they are done at around about one day or two no longer than three into the season now that ensures that the bitch is not carrying any bacteria so you know you try to do everything you can to make certain that you're going to have a very healthy um whelping and that's the main thing sometimes if you're doing a frozen litter the vet might say, well, why do you want that done? If And then you're going to have an elected cesarean. But we do it anyway. We do everything that we can to prevent anything going wrong. And we have been uh, very uh, lucky in that respect. So, you know, it's it's all about keeping in close contact with your vet and, and your elders or, you know, if you have a mentor to help you through this. Not many people i find are willing to help new people they're not they feel that they are encroaching on their domain and i think that's a great pity because you know we can all learn something from each other and we need to help each other to benefit the breed that's really what it's all about the breed not your own personal um predicaments or space whatever you want to call it um you know it's, it's it's a shame, really. Mm -hmm. True, true. Agreed. Uh, now, there's a lot of learning when it comes to health testing with uh, boxers. There's a lot of tests out there as well. Like, for example, there's heart testing, uh, there's hip testing. Uh, well, how important is heart testing for boxers, according to you? Well, I think it's very important. I think that um, when you read a litter, you need to go to um, a sire who is heart tested and you need to make certain that your female is heart tested as well. And everybody should be, both parents, I should say, should be healthy. 
And <clears throat> what we do is when the babies um, are six weeks old, they are inoculated and they are heart tested. That is done with a stethoscope and it's done both sides of the heart and then they're done again at 12 weeks and then we have them tested again at 12 months. That is again done with a stethoscope. If there's no murmurs, which one always hopes that there isn't, and uh, then there's no need, in my opinion, to take that any further. If along further that there is problems, then you have to go to, we have heart specialists here who deal with canines, and uh, then you have to take that step further. Luckily for us, we haven't had to do that. But I think that, you know, when the babies have their inoculations, uh, and uh, at the three up until 12 months. And then after 12 months, we don't have another inoculation until they're, they're three, and then they don't need another one. That over-inoculations is not good because it doesn't help them develop their own immune system, which is mm. very important. Right. It's like a baby, a human baby. Mm. They must build up their own immune systems. Right, true, true, I, I agree. Um... Now, I just want to take, uh, I just have a question based on what you said. Like, for example, you, you are, a, you're a boxer lover, uh, but you all, you know, you have also done the journey. You've taken other roles as well. You're a breeder. Uh, you handle your own dogs. You are a judge as well. Now, from, you know, when you're actually picking a winner uh, as a judge, you know, you're actually promoting that particular dog as a sire. Now, now, uh, unfortunately, those the top the dogs that wife for top honor health testing is not mandatory for them. If well, let's say for mandatory. example, uh, I just want to come quickly to finish my question. Now, if clearing the health testing is made a mandatory requirement for a dog to be considered for the highest honor, would you support it? Well, yes, I would. I mean. You know, you have to be um, logical about it. We don't have that um, requirement here in Australia, but when you join um, the, the Dogs Victoria, uh, you know, you, you agree to breed dogs only for the betterment of the breed, and that includes breeding healthy dogs. And that's the only requirement we have here. But uh, I, I think that that's a fairly good thing, but you're speaking about males. What about the females? Right. Sometimes sure. right. when you're judging, and quite often, um, the female will go best to breed over a male. I've had that happen many times. But, uh, you know, you have to look at both sides of the sex, the male and the female, and it's very easy for people to um, be... be um, sort of memorized one might say by a million uh, by a male stud dog and because he does a lot of winning they might want to use that dog but you have to look at what is behind the dog and you start of course with the pedigree that is very important and true. to see what is actually behind the dog as well mm. mm -hmm. true true Again, again, excellent segue to my next question uh, about pedigrees. Thank you for uh, uh, for that segue. Now, I, I know that you know you you've bred a lot of litters over the years, Rosina. And uh, as a breeder, I've heard in talking to breeders, I've heard that breeding, planning the breeding involves a lot of uh, ex, you know exhaustive analysis about about this sort of pedigrees. Now. I know this is actually a knowledge transfer session and you're sharing your wealth of knowledge with people, fanciers. Could you simplify the process in terms of what is the planning involved or what does the research process look like for new breeders? Well, that's sort of as, I, as, as I've said before, breeding dogs is not really for the faint-hearted. It, it's, it's it starts off with the female and the male, of course, and you would look at the pedigrees. And today it's easier to look at pedigrees on, um, on the computer than it used to be having to, to look at them from, you know, pages and pages of um, paperwork. And you 
what will what I would suggest people do is to take into consideration the first three generations and then take that back to five generations. And if those dogs on there are of good stead, um, then and you like the type of dog that represents the pedigree, then that's the type of dog you would use. But one should really breed to the type of dog one wants to produce. If you see a stunning looking male, he may be gorgeous, and a lot of the males are really upstanding stallions, I call them, and, uh, you know, and they take your eye. The pedigree may not be tightly bred. It's better if it is, but if it's not tightly bred, you can use that dog, and then you can come back in to the male side of the pedigree to what I call cement the pedigree it might take one generation it might take two one has to be extremely patient when breeding good quality dogs providing all the health requirements are in order as well and don't believe what people tell you you make certain you see the health certificates mm -hmm. that's just a tip of mine mm. Absolutely, a very valid point. Uh, <clears throat> I want to actually talk about a bit about different types. You know, we talked about uh, the American type. We, as in, we didn't discuss the types, but we spoke about the American type, the, the English type, the European type dog. Is let's say, for example, if you're starting off with a with an American type bitch, uh, and then elegant bitch and you want to actually work to work that's the ideal you blueprint that you have in sorry, mind catch the uh, question. and no i what i was asking was would you recommend breeding a dog of a totally different type like for example an american style bitch with a european style male or vice versa personally well i wouldn't do that but having said that um, a good dog is a good dog, and if you feel that that dog, um, if we've got an American female and a male from Europe, then if if you feel that that dog has something to offer you that you need with your female, then you could do that. But having said that, you would get a mixed type. You would you would get some of each type, and. You know, if you are happy with that, then you can either breed her again back to the European dog or go back to the American style of dog. Um, I don't like to mix them up too much myself. Um, I like to um, go with what I what I know and what I've learned over the years. And I can fairly well predict from using different dogs that we have exactly what we'll get. We have a very strong line of females. And the females are the foundation of any kennel, any breed, any kennel. If you haven't got good, strong females that can reproduce for you, you're fighting an uphill battle, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. That's what I think about that. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, now, <laughs> a boxer is a man-made breed. We all know, and we've all gone through that research. Um, the unique part of the boxer is also the type of the head. You know, we call it the uh, brachycephalic type of a breed. Um, and we're constantly fighting a battle to produce a dog with an upturn, whereas the nature is actually trying to correct that, uh, you know, with a straight with a straight bite, not with an upturn. Uh, what are your points to produce the correct upturn on a consistent basis? Well, you're right, it's a brachycephalia breed, and um, we want them to have a straight jaw, which is against Mother Nature. Mother Nature generally gives a rounded jaw, but we like the dog to be undershot because you've got to realize that this is a holding breed. It's not a rip and tear like a Doberman. This is a dog that will latch on and hold. And originally, when they used them in the very beginning um, for, for bringing down bulls, they used to have to grab hold of the side of the neck of the bull and hold on. And the undershot jaw allows them to do that with great strength. 
they also have, I might add, uh, lines from the corner of the eye down towards the mother, muzzle. And that was built like that in the, into the breed to allow the blood to run off so it didn't run into their eyes and uh, blind them then they held on and they can hold on i can tell you they can hold on if they latch on to something new <laughs> or oh, we have trouble with possums here and um the 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 girls the the three little maids i call them uh they um they go stalking at night and and i have to be very careful and watch that they don't get any of the young possums that they won't let them go and uh you know they mm. they are a very very powerful jaw um, the canine mm. teeth, of course, are set, and uh, the upper jaw is slightly concave uh, to be able to hold. You don't want a pincer bite. You want a bit of a gap, and uh, that gives the correct bite and also a good chin, which is called the rapandus. And we need to be able to see the rapandus when viewing any heads from the front and the side. So right. not, not a lot of overlip hanging over. That's not functional to the right. breed at all. Mm -hmm. If it was to uh, do the spread, um, uh, Christina, about the bite that you mentioned, um, I know that the brief standard actually does not consider the right mouth to be a disqualification. Uh, you know, you are advised, or one is advised, not to breed a right mouth dog. Uh, do you think rye mouth is genetic or is it basically something which uh, happens because uh, you know of the puppy's upbringing oh goodness um well a rye jaw is very unpleasant when you are looking at a dog when you're judging it you can tell from it not even opening its mouth if it's going to have an offset mouth like rye the nasal label line in the top of the upper lip is not straight it sits to one side and when judges look at the dog's mouths they should check each side of the jaw to make certain that the the uh, canine teeth sit equally apart and that they are in a square locking sort of position a lot of judges flick the lips open and that you know if if you can put your finger there and hide it and a lot of handlers are quite smart about hiding bad mouths um you know um i don't like to see a dog with a right jaw i don't know um really we don't have that problem here but they are in the breed and i don't think they're as much in the breed as they used to be certainly not in this country people are quite um, you know, a particular about the mouths of the dogs. They've got to be able to, you know, eat the food correctly and not chew to one side all the time and wear those teeth down. That mm. I don't have uh, a lot of uh, experience with with right jaws, so I I can't reiterate right. on that anymore. Right. When you're looking no, at no, a baby, no, 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 sorry, to interrupt, but my my question was. Is this nature or is this uh, is this something which is happens because of the upbringing of the puppy? Sorry, you 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 keep coming and going. I can't get the question. Okay. No, I cannot hear you. Okay, can you hear me? All right. I can now. Yes. Oh, wonderful. I, I apologize for the sound quality for everybody who's watching it as well, and uh, mainly to you, Rosina. Uh, no, I was. My question was more about: Is this something that happens because of uh, of the genetic trait, or is that something that happens because you know something went wrong in the puppy growing up? Okay, I think it must be genetic. I do. Mm. Okay. I, I don't know what could happen to a puppy puppy in utero that would would cause that I, mm. I don't think so no i think it must be genetic okay, you wouldn't breed to a mm -hmm. the right jaw anyway mm. right true agreed agreed um i want to actually move on to the next question and again and uh, this is about the uh, there's a term in the box of forums and uh, the forum the, the term that i've seen is the popular the term called as a popular dog syndrome 
you know, every breeder wanting to go to the dog which is winning the most. Do you think that's a boon or a bane for the breed? Well, I think that's up really up to an individual. It, you have to assess the, you're talking about the stud dogs. You have to assess right. whether that dog is worthy of being mated with your female. And, you know, um, fashion can lead to some people wanting to go that way. But you have to be, um, you know, wise I would say and look at the dog what I would say from a distance and 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 his pedigree and any health issues that may be involved there's quite a bit really in my opinion in selecting a stud dog you know it has to be of the correct type to start with and if it comes from a producing bloodline then that that's good but if he doesn't, then, or you may be using the dog earlier in his career, um, you really don't know what you're going to get until you actually do it. You might not like the babies. You might love the babies. And sometimes with some of the well-known <clears throat> imported dogs that have come into this country, we've used them f up to three times and flown bitches all around Australia <laughs> to uh, to get to these stud dogs. And, uh, and it has been proven to be most successful, which is very nice for the breed. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> what the other examples <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> um, uh, Christina, I want to actually uh, take you to the, the question. I know you're very passionate about. Uh, we actually started talking about white boxes uh, last week. Uh, you know, we started about the ancestor of a boxer being a white dog, a white bitch to start with. Uh, now, now there's, a, there's a growing debate which is happening, which is about white boxers, right? Uh, some countries in, like Norway, for example, has now recognized or is recognized white boxers and they actually compete in confirmation shows. Wonderful. That's wonderful. Uh, there's a lot of debate about uh, whether white boxers should be should be bred. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, <clears throat> here um, we can't breed them. Um, we can't show them, but they can now be registered on a limited register. And um, we are working on that that hopefully one day, maybe uh, not in my lifetime, but that they can be uh, can be shown. You've gone away. Where have you gone? Oh, dear, that's better. You went away. Well, I'm, I'm right here. I just wanted uh, the focus on white boxes, and uh, I wanted you to take what to say about white boxes. Yeah, well, well, I love the white boxes. I really do. And uh, they are beautiful, and they are born, and white boxes... The babies tend to be a lot stronger than the coloured dogs. And I have noticed through some um, media on Facebook that they appear to live a lot longer. They are very strong strong, and when they're born and they will push coloured puppies out of the way to feed. But, you know, when they grow and they, they have these white coats and if they're kept in good condition, they have sort of like silver tips on the end of their coats, they're very pretty, and uh, and I am very very fond of them. And um, I think that we should allow them to be shown. I think personally, it's just straight out discrimination. It really is because there are many white breeds that are shown. So why can't we show a white boxer? I mean, people really have to get into the real world and and have to acknowledge that these are living animals. And years ago, it was drummed into us, particularly when I first started, that we had to put them to sleep. And that was very distressful, very, very distressful. And my vet the other day said to me, I can remember when you used to cry. And I used to cry. And they were dear little things. But we do not do that now. We we won't do that now. And I'm I'm glad that that at least is one good thing about it. Right, true. But reading from them, um, if they're mated to a solid dog or a traditional dog, as we like to call them, with very little white or no white at all, it can be a most successful litter. It can be with no whites. Mm -hmm. So 
you have to be, if they were to be bred from, you would have to be extremely careful uh, in your choice of a sire. You would, whether it be brindle dog or a fawn dog, um, you know. Mm. I, I hope in my lifetime I would be able to see them being shown. I really do. I'd love to be the first person to take one of them here. I really would. They're beautiful. True, true. Uh, now, I, I just want to take you to the next topic, uh, which is about artificial insemination. Um, India, uh, artificial insemination was approved by the governing body, the Kenya Club of India. Uh, so a lot of people are interested in learning, knowing about artificial insemination. Now, in this process, as you had stated rightly, breeding boxes is not for the faintest of heart, you know, or people with the faintest of hearts. Um, would you recommend artificial insemination to a nose or a nose breeder, considering the pitfalls associated with it? Well, <clears throat> there are pitfalls. The semen has to be taken, and the younger the dog it's taken from, the better. Um, around about three or four years when the male dog is in his prime. And it can be stored these days, well, in this country anyway, for, for years and years and years. And, um, you know, that, that's a great, great thing to have. And um, the, the pitfalls are that the bitch is inseminated on the wrong day. And what one needs to do is to have progesterone levels taken and they generally started, in my experience, from about day seven or eight, and then you're done every couple of days. And when the bitch is about to ovulate, that's when they are inseminated. There are two ways to inseminate. Um, you can have it done uh, surgically, or you can have it done um, um, without an anaesthetic and the semen is thawed out and then it is just put into the bitch with a with a catheter. Um, I prefer myself to have it done surgically and then I know it's gone and at the right place and then it's a light anaesthetic for the for the female and she she comes home about an hour or so afterwards and then you wait very patiently and if you are desperate you have a scan done, but we usually wait. And around about six weeks, you know whether she has conceived or not. I don't believe in poking and prodding it with females. If one was very worried, one would have an X-ray done. But you can't have an X-ray done too soon because the bone structure won't show up. So that's done at around about eight weeks, eight and a half weeks. And if you know, it's not always possible to tell how many puppies the bitch is carrying because some puppies um, sit high up in the ribcage in a boxer and they can sit one behind the other. So you might think there's three, but in actual fact there might be four. And recently um, there was a, a, a young woman who's now started building boxes and I tried to help her. Um, she was told, to, oh, no, she's, she's only having one or two. Well, she jolly well had 11. And, you know, how, how, how wrong was that of the vet to say that? And some vets are very good and some aren't so good. But in India, I don't know whether you have reproduction vets who specialise only in reproduction. They're the type of vets you really need to, to use. And that may involve some travelling in your country. Um, I, I guess you travel for ear popping and like you do. But, um, you know, um, that's just what you have to do and you've got to do what you've got to do. But the artificial insemination here is excellent. In the beginning, it was extremely poor. The extender that was used uh, on the golden gloves and winter forecast semen, 17 breedings we lost. <clears throat> and when it was thawed out, it just wasn't any good. And that was a shock, a terrible shock. Right. So that, that's my experience with the frozen semen. It can right. be very, very rewarding and we can import semen um, from anywhere in the world, providing that stud dog is still alive. They will not let you bring semen into the country from a dead dog because right. of the rabies. Right. Got it. Uh, Rosina, I actually have a question based on what you said. Now, 
in the US um, or when it comes to artificial insemination, um, there is a DNA or let me let me rephrase my question. There's a lot of DNA um, advancements that has come into the breed, like for example, uh, under, you know, uh, using, you know, you can actually take a swab out of the puppy's uh, mouth, I can take a swab and find out which sire was used for that particular puppy, you know, what's used to breed. Now, in that, with keeping this particular uh, advancement in mind, there have been multiple sires that have been used on the breeding. Like, for example, they want to get, if a breeder wants to get the best of two sires, they try to use both the sires in the breeding. You fight. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Do you think that is actually a way Well, you, you were fading away during that question, but I get the gist of it. Here we can use um, up to two stars on one female. Then you must have them DNA tested to make certain which dogs have come from which sire. Um, I think if you, myself, if you have a very valuable bitch um, and you want her to, and she's getting on in years, you would like a letter from sire A and sire B. So you decide to put both lots of semen in. Now, I've inquired of my vet about doing this with a frozen semen uh, insemination and a live insemination. He said that is not recommended because, in his opinion, he said that the live semen put in will kill off the frozen semen. Hmm. So he must be thinking that the frozen semen is not as strong because they put that directly in so it will take but the live mating of course it's got to swim and that takes at least a 24 hours to to reach its target so um if you were going to have that done i would recommend that anybody thinking about it would have it done um frozen semen from both sides not a live one and a frozen one got to be you know or you could do two live ones i suppose but uh, mm -hmm. i i have not done that um as yet i'm thinking about it for a particular animal i have here she's getting on an age and um, i'm not quite sure what i what i'll do yet i've mm -hmm. got to think about it <laughs> okay. uh, now i, I want to actually move on to puppies now uh, that's the most uh, i think that's the most uh, pertinent topic uh, because you know as a breeder, um, picking the right puppy is extremely important. Uh, and the, in picking the right puppy, uh, you have to assess the temperament of the puppy as well. Uh, how does Rosina assess the, the temperament of the puppy? Oh, well, that's a delightful thing to have to do. You have the babies, and when they start to open their eyes, and they start to move around on their somewhat wobbly legs. <laughs> they um, they have attitudes, and they'll hold their little tails up, and they'll start squabbling amongst each other, and they play, and they like to play with their mother, and they're fairly rough. And as they grow, you observe them, and that's very important. And then when they're around about five to six weeks, we have an area that's undercover where we put them and it's paved and they can walk around and it's a bigger area than in the whelping room. So they've come into the wide world. First of all, they're rather like, I should say, a bunch of penguins. When they come out of the water, they get startled and they will run off back into the water again. But uh, they run back into the whelping box and then little bit by little bit, they'll come out and they'll be inquisitive and you can see their little personalities. They walk around with their tails bolt upright and their little heads held high, and you watch. And you might watch day after day, but certain dogs stand out, and then you have what I call a very even litter, and that makes your choice even more um, difficult. Oh, you've gone away again. What's happened? Oh, oh no no no! I, I'm I'm in the background, Rosina. Go ahead. I I can listen to you perfectly fine. Yes, that's all right. Anyway, so you know we we observe, and then we might run two on. Um, sometimes we run them on till three or four months. Sometimes eight months, and then we make a decision which one we will keep. 
it's easier in my opinion to keep two puppies uh, than one because they keep each other company and uh, they don't um, demand your attention all the time or that of their mother it's it's a matter of knowing what to look for you start of course with the head and a full muzzle and the markings and the white on the puppies i must say and tell the breeders that the white on the puppies will diminish it will you can get a puppy with a narrow full collar but as the puppy grows you might end up with just a little splash on the back of the neck it does diminish and the same on the on the head um, when they're born they have pink noses and lips and that all fills in and uh, it goes black uh, as they progress with their age and also um, with their eyes uh, they I like them to be nice and tight not too tight but nice and tight and then as the puppy grows and starts to tease you will have all sorts of funny things go on their ears go rose like a, a bulldog and their eyes get droopy and of course their teeth are starting to um come out the the trigeminal nerve um which affects the ears but it, it, it can set them up so what we do if we think there's going to be a problem we um we we put vaseline on the underside of the ear fold it over where it should be and just gently gently rub it but when you're in a country like yours and or america where they crop they won't have that problem we have a natural ear here and uh, that's what we do for that and i like the puppies to get used to having their mouths looked at and i tell them that teeth and i open the top lip and the bottom lip just to get them used to feeling and touching their mouths they don't like it very much and they will pull away and you have to persist to make certain that they know you're not going to do anything nasty to them and and i always give them a little tidbit after and i tell them to watch watch and they watch and they get their tidbit which is a bit of cheese or um chicken or whatever you have on hand um right. so it's a sort of a training session for babies right mm -hmm. from when they're at least six weeks old mm -hmm. and we start to stand them up um you know so they get used to having their legs put in the right place and right. at the same time when doing that you can watch the feet uh, that mm -hmm. they're not going down on the pistons and that's very important very important that can be a dietary problem right mm. right um now in, in terms of um, in terms of you know you know you you have the best litter let's assume you know every, everything you know there is some first that you've done in the breeding has given you a wonderful litter uh what would you say uh, would be the ideal way to rear the puppy to add up in terms of diet exercise and nutrition well exercise for puppies has to be um very very carefully done you can't have little puppies running over um, hundreds of meters of uh, terrain you might say they should be confined we don't let any of them out of the conservatory until they um, have had their inoculations and then about 10 days after that and they can have an investigation but puppies being puppies want to get into everything and they get into the garden and they and they get onto the driveway and they might eat gravel or stones and they might eat leaves and sticks and things all these things aren't really very good for them but they're very adventuresome so if you're putting puppies outside into the let's say into your garden then you have to be there and watch that they don't get into trouble if their mother is there to protect them she usually does a very good job we don't let the puppies <clears throat> run with any of the adult dogs they're too rough and they'll just run over the top of them and you can get a broken leg or a eye damage or other horrible things go wrong so you have to be extremely careful with managing them it's rather like rearing a baby and you know when the baby starts to crawl and to stand up and open up cupboards and get into mischief you have to watch because baby puppies of any breed are very adventuresome and they have no fear and they can um come amiss sometimes you have to be very very watchful mm. right true agree um uh, now on the topic of diet um yes 
And again, this is oh. a topic not just for puppies, but for adult dogs as well. Um, there's a growing debate about kibble diet, the raw food diet. I know we touched on it last time, uh, but what does what what does Christina find most effective for? Uh, what do you find the most effective for your dogs? Is it a combination of both? Is it one? Is it the other? It's a combination of both. We feed, um, we rear the puppies. Um, they start having their first taste of meat at about three weeks, and I hand feed it to them so they get the taste of it. And when they've got a taste of it, then we introduce a little bit of the dry food, the kibble, and um, we feed the Royal Canaan Boxer puppy here um, for spe spe specifically for boxes. And um, I find that to be quite good, really. You can have, there are many, many breeds, uh, sorry, many, many varieties of dog foods available in this country. I, I don't know about where you are, but there are many, many types. And each um, person that sells it tells you this one's the best, that one's the best. But you have to sort of work that out for yourself. Sometimes, um, you know, the puppies um are difficult eaters they they don't want to eat food they'd rather just drink from their mother and uh you know you have to wean wean off uh gradually so she's not encumbered with milk and uh, and they they're not unhappy in the toilet department because anything that you give them um is strange <laughs> it can have a horrible effect and you be cleaning up with mops forever but um you know um it, it it's the, the kibble we feed uh, and and the dry food we feed um, with the adult dogs we give them two parts of raw beef to one part of dry food and we give vegetables uh, orange vegetables are the best for dogs and uh, and we feed silver beet not the white stalks and they have sardines and they have eggs now babies should never have a whole egg unless it's cooked Babies should only have the yellow part of the uh, of the egg, and uh, because the white part has abid in it, and that's detrimental to their growth plates. And you don't want to be having anything going wrong with the growing and the growth plates. So you know, it's mm -hmm. and we don't give eggs to babies every day. They they might have it, uh, you know, every second day. Mm -hmm. They have can have a little bit of. Um, sardines it's very very good for the dogs the ones in oil and uh, and the adults have that every second day and they also have uh, coconut oil on their food for their coats coconut oil mm. okay all right Excellent. coconut oil a liquid coconut oil mm. right right um uh, Rosita, so we actually i think in one of our conversations we spoke about you know, reading that exceptional dog, you know, it's a dream for everybody, right? Uh, a dog like that comes once in a while, uh, but, you know, you're always waiting for that exceptional dog. Uh, I've got a question from a viewer here. Uh, Siddhartha Russian uh, says, how often uh, when puppies look exceptional, uh, they don't actually hold their same when they grow up? Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Sorry, you went away. I didn't have, how often is the dog exceptional and the puppy is dead? Is it great? Well, I've read what he's saying on the bottom of the screen here because I didn't quite catch your question. That is true. Yeah, no, my, no, my question can, is uh, puppies are exceptional when they are, you know, when they're puppies, they're exceptional. Uh, but when they grow up, you know, they don't look as promising, right? Uh, how do you hold that promise? Yeah. Is it a magic formula? Oh. <laughs> that's a hard one um sometimes um they they go through gro growth spurts right now i always maintain that if a puppy is gorgeous when it's born and that's when we really look at them when they're born the minute they're born within 12 hours you look at them and you get an idea when you've seen quite a few then you wait for them to start to grow right puppies can go through some ugly phases they really really can they can get gawky they can get long they can get high in 
what I call high in the bum, which means the, high, the hind quarter is higher than the shoulder, they can go through some horrible stages. But I always maintain that a good puppy will come out a good adult at the end of it all. You have to be very, very patient and just wait for them to go through their growth, growth spurts. I mean, their feet can go flat. You have to be very careful of that. And I have to tell you, too, that we do not use any calcium here. I don't. I've been down that road, which was a disaster, and um, I don't use any because I personally believe that my dogs are on a balanced diet, and it's all to do with that. And as the puppy grows, they should be given at least two to three meals a day, well spread out, of course, to help them absorb all the food that they need to make them grow properly. And they, as I said, they can go, and I've had some go through some horrible stages, <coughs> excuse me, really horrible stages. Winter forecast was one of those. Right, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> He, um, he was young. He was <clears throat> he was quite long, and I said to someone, "Oh my God, where did that come from? I've never had a long boxer ever." So, but as he grew up, it all balanced out, and that was my learning lesson. Hmm. Right. The hard uh, way. <laughs> well, we always learn lessons the, the hard way, but uh, that's the benefit of having somebody like you come on this uh, and share your knowledge. So we don't have to actually uh, make the same, uh, you know, we can benefit from your knowledge. Um, now, I want to actually talk about temperaments in a boxer. A boxer was the, uh, the temperament of a boxer. Uh, you know, aggression or shyness in a boxer is not something you would like in a boxer. Uh, but if you had, let's say, for example, if you had a dog or if one has a dog like that, would you recommend that the dog not be shown a bread from? You're fading away. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the okay. last of the question. Yeah, no worries. So if you have a shy dog. Yes. Or a dog which has got a temperament issue, you know, in an aggression, aggressive style. Would you recommend that that dog be bred from? No, I wouldn't recommend a dog should be bred from. No, the, that's not the boxer. The boxer mm -hmm. is his temperament. He's known as a clown. Now, a clown is a happy person and likes to entertain, and the boxer should be full of life and joy. And, you know, aggression in a boxer. It is 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 not a good thing. You, if the boxer <clears throat> is aggressive, you have to wonder what has happened to that dog in his growing ages that has made him this way. Is it a human intervention? Some people are very hard on dogs, and that's not to be tolerated, in my opinion. You have to be gentle, and you have to nurture them along, and one would have to wonder, I mean, it, it's not indicative of a boxer to, to be aggressive. Uh, shyness is a different thing to aggression. A dog can be shy. He may be shy because he's insecure. So you have to find out what has happened to the dog and why is he shy. There must be a reason because the boxer is not made that way and it, it it's... It's a, a foreign, you might say, a foreign a temperament for him. He 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 shouldn't be that way. Uh, mm. I, I I wouldn't show I wouldn't show a dog that was like that anyway. And I wouldn't breed from one if it was a if right. I thought that it was indicative of that particular dog. I wouldn't. Right. You, you don't want that. That's not what mm. the box is about. True. True. Agreed. Um, I, I want to actually move on to the next topic, uh, Christina, which is about maintaining the court condition in a boxer. Do you have any tips uh, on how you can maintain the condition in a boxer? Uh, how, do you, how do you mean? You dropped out a little bit. Oh, in I, I meant, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, 
India. Uh, India is yes. a hot country. Yes, and, it is. Uh, the problem that we face is the court gets extremely dry, uh, and the boxers develop, uh, you know, skin patches, which is which is not pleasing to the eye, and it's not good for the dog either. Do you have any tips to share on how to maintain the dog's coat in hot conditions? Oh, goodness. Well, <clears throat> they should be kept in. Uh, I know it can get hot there in the dog, so it can get very cold. And I think the dog needs to be kept in an, in an even environment and in, in warmth around about, I would say, uh, between 18 and 23 degrees of uh, heat or temperature. And um, some people may have keep keep their dogs uh, in India in their homes, which would be um, regulated for humans and therefore the dog would be comfortable. The dog needs <coughs> something soft to lie on and uh, a bed, like a hammock bed up off the ground and we put carpet on ours and a blanket as well. But to keep the coat condition, a lot of that is to do with what the dog is fed as well. And um, there are certain preparations you can rub into the coat. Um, I use quite a few horse preparations, which are excellent on the boxer's coat because it's a tight, smooth coat. Um, you can rub the baby oil into the coat and scrunch it up a bit, you know, with your fingers and then wipe it all off. Uh, that'll put some, uh, like, lanoline into the skin to make it supple. It's a bit like treating a baby's skin you know you don't just bath a baby and put lots of powder on that doesn't work you put some moisturizer on and if you can put a, a good quality moisture on uh, moisturizer on um, a boxer's coat particularly on the nose because their noses tend to dry out a bit and they can become quite crusty and uh, you can use vaseline for that which is probably easier for you to get than what i use but uh, there are many preparations you can get in the horse products um, i don't know what the equestrian um, following is like in your country but here it's quite strong and we have uh, numerous um you know uh, horse uh, shops that sell all sorts of things and particularly the good shampoos and the purple shampoo i use for the white and that brings the white really mm. up well so, uh, you know, it's, it's you have to um, look after the dog like you would look after a, a baby. And that's what I say to people. You know, you, mm -hmm. if, if your baby gets, don't run next door, you go to a doctor. So if right. your dog is not in top, you will go to a vet. Mm. True, true. Uh, um, I, I want to actually ask you about showing now. Um, you are, you have gotten great success being uh, a handler yourself, um, you actually, you know, you've shown your own dogs, most of your own dogs, and uh, I know in Australia professional handlers do not exist or are not allowed. Uh, being an owner handler yourself and observing other owner handlers, uh, what are the common mistakes that you notice owner handlers do? Oh, that's easy. They run too fast. <laughs> they think they're in a greyhound race, <laughs> and the dogs are flying all over the place, and it's and and the people are going flat out and usually running out of breath, um, like I do. But uh, anyway, I think that is the commonest mistake people make. They take the dogs too fast, and you cannot assess correct movement if the dog is moving too fast. It rockets around too much, and it and it doesn't hold together well the dog should move at a steady pace which has got reach and drive right. and that's what you want to see uh, mm -hmm. in the ring and uh, it's a nice steady pace it's not slow but it's not flat out fast it's nice and steady mm -hmm. and that's the way the dog should be moved um you right. know uh, a lot of the handlers um need help um we were running down at the kcc park here some handling classes they were done once a month and there were other people there that went to help show people what to do if they wanted to show their dogs it was a nice social sort of 
a gathering for an hour or so and the uh, young people that did it were very very good and you could take young dogs down there puppies to not only socialize them but get them into a sort of a, a show dog situation where they would be moving with other breeds i find that when the boxes are first taken out to the show ring they're, they're good with their own breed but then when you progress into classes from baby puppy through to open um well, mainly in the younger generation of dogs uh they're not used to having other dogs behind them or in front of them and um we judge dogs here in alphabetical order so behind the boxer we have a bull mastiff which is usually huffing and puffing away and the boxes are very cute curious to that what i do is i get my dog and i turn it towards that dog that's making all the noise but there's always a, a, a suitable gap between each dog we're not allowed to cram pup here um some people like to move up on your dog if they think it's going to misbehave to spoil your dog's chances i don't like that i just say to them politely would you mind moving back a step or two and they generally do i don't like handlers throwing bait all round in the ring i think that's very bad because when handlers are baiting dogs mm. they shouldn't be throwing bait which when the next dog comes along behind it that disturbs that dog because all it wants to do is sniff at the ground and pick up the bits of bait bait right. baiting can be used at home to train the dog to either look at your hand or look at your pocket and uh you know that's the way we do it i often carry a piece of bait in the side of my mouth and mm -hmm. the dog knows i've got it there and i'm not my finger on it and put it in front of the dog and flip my hand but i don't throw any bait around and i think that's right. that's not a fair game really you mm -hmm. know it's not right. a fair game right right what are your thoughts about double handling Oh, I don't agree with that. Um, we are not allowed to do that here. There are penalties for it if you're double handling. Um, when they have the German Shepherd shows, um, they have people running around the outside of the ring, yelling and screaming and waving cloths at the dogs and throwing balls in the air. And, you know, it, it's a very, very rowdy scene. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't agree with that. I think the dog should show on its own merits myself. That's what I think about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, I actually wanted to ask you, uh, Rosina, uh, uh, what is the optimal size uh, for any breeder to actually have in terms of the number of dogs? Would, would, you, would you say five is the right number? Would you say 50 is the right number? What is the right size? Well, there, there isn't any. I mean, that's up to the to the person that's looking after the dogs. Um, I, I I think um, you know a half a dozen dogs, um, you know, is usually good. Some people only keep females, and um, and then they go to outside stud dogs. Uh, that's their choice, and that's quite a good way to be. If you keep a stud dog, um, you might tend to use that rather than go to an outside dog because the dogs there it's handier and uh, there's expense involved of course when you're using outside dogs but right. if you can afford you know i would think no more than 10. um that's a lot of dogs to look after and make mm -hmm. certain they're all exercised and groomed and i wipe my dogs over every day uh, mm -hmm. check their ears and check their teeth and their toenails and right. it's most important the toenails are kept short and i do mine with a grinder and they hold their foot up and i just go zap 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 and all done uh, rather mm -hmm. than cut them because that makes a noise and a squeeze on the foot and they don't like that but you know it's, it's it, it depends really what your facilities are as to how many you can keep but i think that the days of the big kennels particularly in america uh, has gone it, people mm -hmm. can't afford to keep a lot of dogs anymore food is expensive and you have here we have council regulations and you have to get permits and you know it's sort of uh, a bit prohibitive really i want to actually um, ask you this question as somebody who stayed in the breed for many many years and I'm, this is also going to be my last question to you as well uh, 
you have been in the breed for many years. How do you keep yourself motivated? Um, you've bred a lot of champions. You have actually produced some really nice dogs. But what keeps you going? Well, that's an easy question. It's my love of the boxer. It just is my love of the breed. That's what keeps me going. They entertain me. They're the reason to get up in the morning, particularly now when it's so very, very cold here. Uh, two degrees here again this morning. And uh, they they sleep indoors and we have a really large room for them. And they all have their own individual crates, which I call their little bedrooms. <laughs> and uh, they have to be put out and uh, to, to do their toilets. And uh, that's that's the thing that keeps you going. It's um, you know, it's easy to want to lie in bed all day, I suppose, in the cold weather. But when you have a, a you know a number of dogs, um, you have to get up and you have to do that. And then puppy, uh, little Samuel has to be fed, and mothers and some of the bitches here are losing a bit of condition because of the cold weather. So they all have breakfast. And the others all have a great big dog biscuit. It's, uh, you know, they, they all get their tidbits. And then they wait at the back door and some call out by barking. They want to come in. They've had enough. They might only go out for five minutes. And no, we want to come back inside into the warmth. And that's what happens uh, here, you know. It's, uh, it's just my love of the breed. Uh, when I lived in New Zealand, we had um, some Boston Terriers um, from Canada and the UK, and they did very, very well as well. But I had a young family to raise with my then husband, who's since passed away. And I have three children, um, two daughters and a son. And, uh, you know, um, the Bostons were quite, quite nice, but really not my cup of tea. I had the boxes first. And we still had a couple of uh, boxes with the Boston Terriers. But when I came to Australia, there were two came with me, and um, Babalu, um, Hannes, or um, Showstopper, she was the first one that came in, and the old dog, Bo. And, uh, and, and they came, and, uh, and I it went on from there, you know, it just sort of, um, there is, to me, there is no other breed. I'm not interested in getting lots of breeds. Uh, I know there's some lovely dogs and people probably think their dogs are the best too. But I happen to think that the Boxer is the only dog for me. It's full of uh, and, and temperament and energetic and, mm -hmm. and I like that. <laughs> Keeps <Wonderful>. me going. <laughs> uh, Rosina, I want to thank you so much for your time. Um, you know, I... You know, I actually, you know, after the first interview, I actually came back to you and I asked you if you would do another one and you graciously accept it. And, uh, you know, what an interview it has been. Uh, I found it extremely useful and, uh, you know, something which I will go back and, uh, you know, look at if I had a question or two. Uh, and I'm sure we covered a lot of topics today. Uh, I, again, wanted to thank you for the time. Uh, now, before I go, I just do want to thank you, thank you, thank my team, uh, which is helping me in the background. Um, I want to thank Sushan. Uh, I want to thank uh, Satish, uh, Jaisama, Kadir, uh, and uh, and of course, if there, if I missed out any names, I want to thank everybody, and I want to specifically thank you for your time. Well, you're very welcome, and I hope that you know we have been able to help in some small way, and uh, you know, and I wish the boxes in India all the best. You've got some lovely dogs there, and I'm sure you can become really top. I really do, if you breed them correctly. Thank you so but much. Thank you. Have, have you. Have yourself a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.